Hebrews 2, and verse 9. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the word of God. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Let's pray together. Lord, the truth of your word is inscrutable in the sense that no one, no man, no woman, no boy, no girl ever gets to the bottom of it to know its heights and depths and the riches contained in even a single verse. And Lord, we are blind without the Holy Spirit giving us sight or else we see things so so much in a fuzzy way that we, we miss the main thing you're saying unless you give us insight. We need sight and we need insight. We ask for both that you might be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to ask you to take a trip in your imagination and imagine yourself in a chair, a very comfortable chair, a luxury recliner chair. See yourself sitting in that chair and God then having the task of explaining the meaning of everything, of life and everything in this world and even the universe to you, hoping that you feel good after his explanation, hoping that you'll accept his explanation, hoping that all sits well with you as you sit in your chair, that you'll open your heart to him and even forgive him for the things he has done. It's explained to you that God is doing the very best he can given the circumstances he has to operate in, in that he's given man this amazing thing called free will. His hands are very much tied behind his back, and if you knew all that was going on behind the scenes and understood he's doing the very, very best he can do, you might give him maybe not a 10 out of 10 in your ratings as you sit in your chair, but a good solid 5 or 6. And you would uh, conclude, at least he's trying. After this explanation, I understand this God, he is trying. He's really trying hard. Imagine that scenario. And I think once you do it, you have to discount it because it's preposterous. It's a theory. It's totally detached from reality, the reality that the Bible describes. I want to ask you as a Christian, do you believe the Bible is alone the Word of God? That being the case, the Bible explains life and the universe. And far from being you at the center of the universe in the comfy recliner, God having to explain things, there were people that did have a lot of questions for God, and the book of Job is all about that. And Job realized that God wasn't going to show up as Job sat in that comfy chair. In fact, that was not the case. God just asked Job questions. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? When I made Orion? When I did this? When I did that? Where were you? I don't recall having to ask your opinion on anything. The reality, the purpose, the ultimate purpose of the universe, and I know this is a shock, The ultimate purpose of the universe is not that you would feel comfortable about everything, but that God would get glory. That's the story of the Bible. History is his story. That God would get glory in all that he is, all his attributes being put on display. That's the reason for everything. The Bible declares the heavens declare the glory of God, Psalm 19, verse 1. There are stars, there are planets out there that we may never discover, but they're out there, and they have nothing to do with us. They regulate no tide on earth as the moon affects the tides. We need the moon, we need the sun. But there are things out there that have no 
correspondence to the reality of our earthly existence because they were made not for earth and the people on it, but for God and his glory. And if there's one thing not made for us, by the way, that's the case, then nothing was made for us but for him. Now, it has suited God in his glory to make earth suitable for man. But the creation itself is for God. And at the end of all things, where history is headed, it is not that we would feel we've had an adequate explanation for everything. I can now accept this God. No, it's about God being glorified for all that he is in his sovereignty, in his justice, in his mercy, in his love. Every attribute of God fully on display, that's where we're headed. And for God to do things for any other purpose would be less than perfect because the only thing that is perfect is to do things for the glory of God. And even God does all things for his glory. He saves us because he loves us and for his glory. And he will be glorified in his justice as well as in his love and in his mercy. That's the God of the Bible. So, ladies and gentlemen, neither you nor I sit in the chair. I'd actually like to, like like Jesus turned over the tables of the money changers, I want to turn over that chair and throw it out the buildings of our minds. There is actually a chair, it's a seat. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. All of us will appear before him as he sits in judgment on us. Imagine, rather than a recliner, a courtroom scene. God sitting in his splendent, resplendent majesty on his throne, and every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, standing before him to give an account. None of us sitting. All of us, in fact, each of us individually, standing before him one at a time. I know when I came to Christ, I had a father who was a preacher, but also was a wife, Peter, my mother, I heard her screams often in the next room as I was a little kid. And when I came to Christ, I realized I would one day stand before him and I could not make the excuse, I would have loved you, I would have served you, but my dad. If I'd have raised that, I'm sure at the judgment seat, God would say this, I'll deal with your dad separately. What about you? That second scenario, the courtroom scenario, is the reality From the very first verse of our Bibles, God rules and reigns. He didn't ask anyone's permission. He just said, let there be. Some advice. Because he's the judge, and never asks us if we'd like to have a turn to sit in his chair, when the judge comes into the court, don't be found sitting in his chair. Just a good piece of advice. I say all this because in reality, God is ruling, God is reigning, and he's made it very clear that's the case. And for you and I to make sense of the universe, this is the truth. Anything else is vanity. Anything else is falsehood. I say all this to say this. Much in the professing church of our day puts man in the recliner. And the message is, if I can, over the next few minutes, I don't want to take too much of your time, Time is precious, so for 15 minutes for the sermon, the sermonette for the Christianettes. I'll tell you about this God who I'm sure if you give him the chance, give him 30 days, I've actually heard this, give God a try, give him a month, put him first for a month and see how your life is. Is that the message? No, but it's what's being proclaimed. Much in today's professing church allows man to stay in the recliner. The man will decide if he'll give God his blessing, even if he'll give him a hearing. And perhaps he might feel better after hearing God's explanation of how things are being run. He might give God the opportunity to work in his life a little bit. How's that played out? Well, there are preachers out there, popular preachers, to be sure, who boast that in the last decade, they've never mentioned the word sin. And they boast about that. They think that's healthy. They think that's good. They boast of that. Obviously, you can't go verse by verse through just about any book of the Bible that way. You have to preach from selected texts and avoided 
avoid the next verse that mentions sin. Well, they say, people are already bogged down. They've got enough to worry about without you adding to all that. They don't need something else to worry about, like the anger of God. No, 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 no. They, they need a pep talk. They need a moral pep talk, to, like a halftime team talk from the coach. You, you're doing good. You're doing good. But let's go for it in this second half of your life, really. Yeah, they don't need another thing to cause them stress or discomfort. The preaching is man-centered, and it's as if the preacher says, sit in the chair as I try to bring you an explanation. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not merely not accurate. That's a defiance of God and his message. The Bible's not a self-help book. If you find the Bible in a self-help section of a bookstore, it's in the wrong place. The Bible's not given to improve your situation or circumstance. Now, certainly applying the Bible to our lives will improve our lives. There is an instruction aspect of the Word of God. There's no doubt of that. The book of Proverbs is filled with all of that. But the Bible's not a self-help book in essence. What it is, is God's plan to rescue guilty, treasonous rebels and sinners. It's a rescue plan. That's what the Bible is. Have you ever heard this? Uh, The Ten Commandments, even if you have a church that will teach on the Ten Commandments, they still allow man to be in the recliner. And they say, these commandments, I know they're commandments, but I just want to suggest to you that you implement them because your life will be better if you do it. And it's again with man sitting in the recliner and thinking, yes, I think it would be better if I did certain things rather than other things. Yeah, I'll give that a go. But that's not what the Ten Commandments are. They are commandments because God is God and we're not. And we owe him 100% perfect, absolute obedience. God is holy. And you and I owe him perfect obedience. And anything else is high treason before a holy God. Here's the biblical message. God is coming to his courtroom and you will stand before him when he comes. Don't be found sitting in his chair or any chair, because there is no recliner in God's courtroom. God won't be coming to give an explanation of everything to you. Um, But but preacher, don't you understand, some people won't like that message. People like the recliner. Uh, Yeah, I understand, I get it. But my job as a preacher is to shout, out loud enough to be heard. Get out of the chair, sinner. He's coming. Christ is coming to judge the living and the dead. In fact, when God, through Paul to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, spoke about uh, preaching the word, it's in this context. I charge you in the presence of God, under the gaze of God and of Christ Jesus, who's to judge the living and the dead And by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, herald the word. The preacher who will not mention the word sin is a traitor. As the preacher who allows man to sit in the recliner is a traitor. There is no recliner. There's only a judgment seat. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. I don't know what percentage of the churches in America will not even mention that verse, but I think it will be a high percent. Oh, I can never love a God like that. I understand. Unless God gives you a new heart, you never will. But our job as the church is to proclaim the truth, to be heralds and bearers up of the truth. We're to be the pillar of truth. A pillar is something that holds something other than itself up. The church isn't the authority. The Word of God is the authority. And it's the Word of God that has brought forth the church. We know there's a God, but outside of God working in our heart, we don't want Him. Therefore, we make up our own God we're more comfortable with. We sit in our recliner and we think, I prefer a God like this. It's not only those who make idols with hands and with wood or metal that are guilty of idolatry, we all are. Whenever you hear a sentence starts like this, 
To me, God is, what you're about to hear is idolatry. That's all it can be, a made-up God. The God who really is, is the God of the Bible. This is God's inspired word. This is his self-disclosure. R.C. Sproul, years ago, in referring to the concept of weightiness, what is a weighty message, he wrote these words. The whole idea of weight or weightiness is one that is found throughout the Bible. In the first instance, the glory of God is described in terms of its inherent and eternal weightiness. Those who take God lightly are those who have no regard for his glory. In our day, the weightiness of the gospel itself has been eclipsed. Hear this. I doubt if there's a period in the history of the church in which professing evangelicals, that's supposed Christians, have been as ignorant of the elements of the biblical gospel as they are today. That's quite a statement when you know something of church history and the dark ages. None in terms of generations have been as ignorant of the biblical gospel as they are today. There's a stark contrast between the second bestseller in the history of the English language, second only to the Bible, namely John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, and the runaway bestseller of the last few years, The Purpose Driven Life. In Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, I'm still quoting Sproul here, we see set forth in masterful literary, literary style the depths and the riches of the biblical gospel. When we compare it to the purpose-driven life, we see a book in which it's difficult to find a full explanation of the biblical gospel. Justification, the relief from the burden of sin that weighs down the soul is all but absent in the setting forth of a new and different gospel of achieving or discovering purpose in one's life. One of the leaders of the recent emerging church movement boasts that he's not mentioned the word sin in the last 10 years of his preaching. He wants to make sure that his people will not feel crushed by guilt or a loss of their self-esteem. When the acute awareness of guilt is removed from the conscience, there is no sense of the burden of sin. There is no sense of being under the crushing weight of the law of God that bears down upon our soul's relentlessly. He goes on, however, if we turn our attention to the insights of Bunyan set forth in the classic uh, Pilgrim's Progress, we see a story that focuses on the groaning pressure of a man who's weighed down to the depths of his soul with a burden of which he's unable to rid himself. It's like the Apostle Paul's description in Romans 7 of the body of death that crushes the spirit In the very first paragraph, on the first page of Pilgrim's Progress, Bunyan pens these lines. Now he's quoting John Bunyan. As I walked through the wilderness of this world, I lighted on a certain place where was a den, and I laid me down in that place to sleep, and as I slept, I dreamed a dream. I dreamed, and behold, I saw a man clothed with rags, standing in a certain place with his face from his own house, a book in his hand, and the great burden upon his back. I looked and saw him open the book and read therein. And as he read, I, he, he wept and trembled. And not being able longer to contain, he broke out with a lamentable cry saying, What shall I do? Let's go in our Bibles to John chapter 3. Passage read earlier in our service. We're familiar with aspects of this chapter. Verse 16 being the most famous verse, I think, in the entire Bible. But verse 36 is also in this chapter and in our Bibles. Look at this, John 3, 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. This truth about the wrath of God is very close to a revelation of the love of God. Verse 16 to verse 36 is not a lengthy read. You can do it in just a couple of minutes. It's not like chapter 84 somewhere there's this mention of wrath, but you've forgotten it. 
because you may even never get there. No, in the context, the very context of verse 16, verse 36 supplies. And what we should not do with this is say, well, of the two verses, I prefer verse 16. It's not a question of what we prefer. What we need to do is harmonize and understand by thinking and studying how to harmonize verse 16 and 36 because both are the inspired word of God. God's wrath remains on the unbeliever. If we don't feel the weight of this, we should. But, but I prefer to talk about the love of God. I understand But verse 36 will still be there in the morning and every morning after. Both of those verses are true. Let me just see your hands. Do you believe that? Amen. I believe that. In our day, there's a message out there, very popular, called the unconditional love of God. You ever heard of that? To quote Sproul again, when preachers announce from their pulpits that God loves people unconditionally, there's hardly any reason for the hearer to feel any burden or cry out with any lament saying, what shall I do? If indeed God loves us unconditionally and requires nothing of us, I'll just insert this because that's what unconditional means, then obviously there's no need for us to do anything. But if God has judged us according to the righteousness of his perfect law and has called the whole world before his tribunal to announce that we are all guilty, that none of us is righteous, that none of us seeks after God, that there is no fear of God before our eyes, that we are in the meantime before the appointed day of judgment, treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath, then anybody in his right mind, and even those in their wrong mind, would have enough sense to cry out with the same lamentation, what shall I do? End of quote. If you hear a message on the unconditional love of God, there's nothing in you that says, what shall I do? You just think, well, I love me too. This is wonderful. God loves me and I love me. What a great relationship. But I hear what you're saying and you sound like a hellfire preacher. What is a hellfire preacher? It's a preacher of the Bible. Preacher, that'll just instill fear in people's hearts and minds. Yeah, that's right. Well, fear is not a good motivation. I believe, I've heard this a hundred times, I believe the right motivation to come to God is love rather than fear. Oh, you want to correct Jesus? Fear is not a good motivation. Who told you that? You trace it all back, it's a slippery snake. In the garden, it's the devil himself. You see, when a truck's coming down the road at 60 miles per hour, fear of stepping out in front of that truck is actually a good and healthy thing. I did that with every one of my kids. Children, don't run out into the street. There are cars. What's cars, Daddy? Well, I'll tell you, that's a car, that's a car. Don't step out. Even if your favorite ball has gone out into the street, look both ways three times, times flurry before you ever go out into the road. And it's been a means of their preservation ever since. It's healthy to fear some things. Hear the words of Jesus, Matthew 10, 26. Do not fear, verse 28 or other, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him. This is Jesus talking. Fear him, God, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Jesus said it's a healthy fear. The fear of the Lord, as Proverbs would put it. The beginning of wisdom. Back to Sproul. He writes this. The story of Christian, the man in the story, It's the story of a man who is burdened by the weight of sin. His conscience was smitten by the law, but where the law is eliminated in the church, no one needs to fear divine judgment. Without the law, there's no knowledge of sin. Without a knowledge of sin, there's no sense of a burden. Well, pastor, you've quoted verse 36. Can we just also talk about verse 16 as well? Okay, let's do that. Let's go to verse 16. John 3 Verse 16. Look, 
preacher, you can't be right. God so loves the world. How do we understand verse 16? Well, let's go to the text. For God so loved the world. There it is. Yeah, how are you going to deal with that, preacher? I'm going to tell you. God so loved the world. But what do those words mean? There are two possible ways to understand this word so in the English language. And you understand, I understand, so is not the original. The Greek words are the original. So is a translation of the original. But in our English translations, we have the word so. What does it mean? Well, there are two ways to understand the word so. It could be that the emphasis is on the greatness of the love being displayed. You know, I sometimes write letters and I say thank you so much and then I capitalize the word so. Thank you so much. I don't want to just say thank you. I want to say thank you. And I want to say thank you so much. Is that what we see in John 3.16? God so loved the world. Is that what we see? Well, that would be better than a lightweight so. You know, he so loves the world. That would be better than a lightweight thank you. Thank you. Oh, pastor says thank you. Yeah. But if I say so thankful, uh, thank you, uh, thank you so much, you think, oh, he, he actually means it. That's great. That could be the possible, in English anyway, understanding of the word so. But there's a second understanding of the word so in the sense of just so. Let me explain. When I was a young kid, I believe it was my mother who was teaching me how to lay the table. Not lay an egg, can't do that, lay a table. And you, first of all, get the plate in the right place, and then you get the knife, and you put it to the right of the plate. Uh, Not upside down, but the right side up. And then you go to the fork, and you put it on the left-hand side of the plate, and then you go to get the spoon, and that's above the plate, and you lay it out. Just so. And that was the instruction. Do it this way. Do it in this way. And do it in this way every time. She was giving me instruction as to the right way to lay the table. There are wrong ways, probably 85 different wrong ways, but this is the right way. And when I ask you to lay a table from now on, I'm asking you to do it just so. That's the meaning of John 3.16. We ask the question, is it the first use or the second use? The answer is, here in John 3.16, it's that second sense. In other words, what John 3.16 says, God loved the world just so, in this way, in this manner. This is the way he loved the world. God loved the world just so, in this way. That's helpful. As we read through our Bibles and we read verse 16, God loved the world just so, in this way. How did he love the world? The rest of the verse tells us that he gave his one and only son. Well, we've got to come, first of all, to the word world. And there it is. God just so loved the world. There it is. Well, what does the word world mean? We read into this the idea that it's every single person in the world. That could be. But if you read through John's Gospel, you'll find there are ten, ten different ways that the author, John, uses the word world in that Gospel. In my first book, I outlined ten different ways. Uh, I wasn't the first to come up with this. I found it and put it in my own words, but it's ten different. There are ten different ways the word world, the word world is used in John's Gospel. And it could be one single Greek word, cosmos, but it can be used ten different ways. It can mean the entire universe. It can mean the the physical earth. It can mean the world system. It can mean all humanity minus believers. It can mean a big group but less than all people everywhere. It can mean the elect only. It can mean the non-elect only. It can mean the realm of mankind. It can mean Jews and Gentiles, not just Israel, but many Gentiles also. And it can mean the general public. And it's the context in which we find the word that tells us the meaning of how that word is to be understood. 
I believe a right understanding of the word world here means humanity. God just so loved the world, meaning humanity. Think of it this way. I don't believe there are aliens on Mars, but should there be, and God loved the people of Mars, the aliens of Mars, we would read something like this. God so loved the Martians, the people of Mars, the aliens of Mars, that he gave his one and only son. Of course, that's not what happened. He came to Earth, not Mars. But the point being made is we can understand God loved the race of Martians by doing something. Just so. That's what we're reading. And so the word world here means, I believe, humanity. Now, putting all this together, God loved humanity in this way that he gave his one and only son. It was the giving of the son that showed his love for the people of this world. That's what we're reading in John 3.16. That's how his love has been shown. God, in his love for the world, gave his only son. Not that everybody would be saved. Notice that. But whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The giving of the Son was not so that everyone would be saved, but that certain people would be saved, those who believe in Christ. And their destiny is not one of perishing, but in contrast to that, they will have eternal life. That's not how you and I have maybe heard John 3.16 spoken about. We hear often this, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, the emphasis on the whoever. In other words, everybody's got the ability to believe, that's what's assumed, and if they'd only do so, they'd have eternal life and not perish. But the actual original reads something like this, God loved the world in this way, that he gave his one and only son, that all the ones believing, it's a phrase hard to express in English, but all the believing ones, all those who do this rather than that, all those who believe will have this outcome rather than that. They will have eternal life rather than perish. What does the verse teach about who will believe or who can believe? Hear this, absolutely nothing. It doesn't discuss who will believe. It doesn't discuss who can believe. It just says all the ones who do believe will have this outcome rather than the other. And all of that is because of the main verb, God giving his son for the purpose that every believing one should not perish, but that every believing one should have eternal life. What John 3.16 teaches is a limitation a particular rather than a universal redemption. Not everybody will be saved. Only those who believe in Christ will be saved. And Christ was sent into the world for that purpose. So the believing ones would not perish but have eternal life. That's the purpose of the giving. So what John 3.16 teaches is all who do A, believe in him, will not B, perish, but will have C, everlasting life. So who will believe? Well, that is not addressed in this verse. It's everywhere else in our Bible. In fact, you don't get to get out of John 3 before you understand it in the earlier verses. Unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless regeneration takes place, unless he's made alive spiritually, he's not got a 50% chance of entering. He's got no chance of entering because with that stone heart, there's nothing in him that wants Christ or to believe in him. Unless someone is first born again, they will in no way enter the kingdom of God. John 6, I told you that no one can come to me unless it's given him by the Father. All who exercise true faith will certainly be saved. 
And that's what John 3.16 teaches. Anyone believing in Christ will not perish but have eternal life. Who will have faith? Those who God gives faith as a gift. Why do I say this? Because last week we were talking about the everyone that Jesus tasted death for. And you realize only with this understanding can we make, make sense of all the verses in the Bible. I don't want to just say I prefer this verse to that verse. I want to be able to say I believe verse 16 and I believe verse 36. And if you are here as a non-believer, you're in mortal danger. Mortal danger. More than that, the wrath, the anger of God is upon you. It's my duty to tell you that so that you run, so that you flee to Christ. You actually need Christ more than you need your next breath. If oxygen was taken out of the room, we'd be gasping for air and we'd do anything for just a little air to breathe another breath. But eternity is a long time and you must know where you stand before God before you leave this life. The Bible says it's appointed for man to die once and after this, the judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. So how about you? Are you one of the people Jesus died for? There's a limitation. He died for his sheep. He gave himself for the church. He laid down his life for his friends. How will I know? One of the things we can do as Christians is unlearn some things. I was taught that the way to evangelize is to, first of all, spell out the love of God for everyone. Another man came to R.C. Sproul one time and said, asked the question, did Jesus die for me? He said, well, have you come to faith in Christ? He said, no, not yet. And Sproul's answer was intriguing. He said, well, let's wait and see. You see, those he died for will come to Christ. All that the Father gives me will come to me, Jesus said, John 6, 37. But, but this wrecks my evangelism. No, it, it might effect, uh, affect your type of evangelism, the way you've been schooled and trained, but I want to be biblical. And if you look through the book of Acts and the preaching of the apostles, they didn't walk into cities and say, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Look, they don't, they don't even mention once the love of God. I'm sure it's okay to talk about the love of God, but it's an interesting thing that they never mention it. They talk about God as judge. One day everyone will stand before him. You've killed and crucified the Messiah, but God raised him up and your witnesses. That was the message. But instead, we've been told that to go to someone, we must say, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Listen, if you're given the task, it was Ray Comfort that taught me this, the task of going on 9-10, not 9-11, the day before 2001, to one of the towers, the twin towers, and your assignment is to preach the gospel to everyone under the sound of your voice in a room on one of the floors of one of the twin towers, and you know, but you're not allowed to say, you know this, but you're not allowed to say, every one of the people you're speaking to will come back the next day and will die. What would your message be? Would you change your sermon? And the message would be, yeah, probably, yeah, I, I think there'd be a new urgency. I wouldn't say things like, would you consider Jesus? Go back to your room and, and uh, go back to your home and over the next few days, think about this, would you? No, there would be an urgency. Pleading with men and women, you must come to Christ before it's too late. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't know when any of us will die. We're not even promised today, let alone tomorrow. The Bible doesn't even say today. It says more specifically now. 
Today is the day of salvation, but now is the acceptable time. Now come to Christ. Repent now. And Ray Comfort, his point was, if you had to change your message because of that new circumstance, what you had previously was not the gospel. Because the gospel is unchanging. It's an eternal gospel. So I want to look through my Bible and say, what does it say about how to evangelize? And you say, but if you don't start where people are and let them in their recliner, yeah, that's the point. If you let them in the recliner, you're going to bring forth another message. But the message is, as you sit in the recliner, consider the attributes of Christ. No, get out of the chair. God's on the throne. You're going to stand before him. Repent now and believe the good news. What is the good news? That God loved the world in this way. Though he could have left us to our treason, he could have left us to our shaking our hands in the fists of, shaking our fist in the face of God. He could have left us in that perilous condition. But in his love for the people of this world, all people everywhere, in his love he's given a son. And if someone will repent and believe in him, they're not going to perish. What a great message. This Christ was born of a virgin, lived a sinless, flawless, perfect life, died upon the cross, rose again from the dead, and is now at the place of all authority. This is not a message whereby we stand alongside Buddha and Mohammed and say, will you give us a turn to gain people's attention? This is the only way of salvation. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. There's no other mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus. Acts 4, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. You must as a necessity. And so for the people in the Twin Towers, you say, you must come to Christ with everything in me. And unless that's urge, that urgency is stressed by the preacher, he's a fake. He's committing high treason. No, in the light of of the coming judgment of God, preach the word. The one who'll judge the living and the dead, knowing that not everybody's going to like it. Do it in season, do it out of season. Strawberries are either in season or out of season. That means all the time. Do it when they like it, do it when they don't like it. Do it when they applaud and pat you on the back and do it when they throw stones at you. You preach the word. That's your job. Stay at your post. For the time will come where they will not endure, put up with sound doctrine, but will heap to themselves preachers on Christian television who tell them what their itching ears want to hear. You're in the chair, would you consider this? Here are 10 suggestions that might improve your life. Now God is God, we're not. Jesus came for a people. Are you part of that group? We pray for revival, and rightly so. We pray for reformation, and rightly so. Both are not competing with one another. I pray that there will be a revival of the preaching of the Word of God, and ladies and gentlemen, there is a famine in our land. But there's rising up a great group of people who say, just tell it like it is. Tell it like it is. Tell me about God as He really is. Behold, Paul wrote, the goodness and the severity of God. Preach both. God is good. And that's not good news for the sinner because God is good in his love and in his justice. He's good at justice. Not every judge on earth is good at justice, but God is. That's not good news for us. But here's the good news. On the cross, Jesus endured the justice we deserved. In our place, this Christ, this unblemished, spotless lamb, went to the cross in our place, the place of sinners. And he died for all those who would put their faith in him, the elect. And he died vicariously in our place. In my place condemned he stood, the hymn says. All we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the heart of the gospel. You don't get there in the preaching. You don't get there. 
You don't get there at all. The cross is central. And if you can preach, preacher, if you can preach what you preach, and no Muslim, no Judaizer, no Buddhist, no Confucianite, no this or that is offended, you haven't preached the message. The cross is an offense to Jews, a stumbling block, to Greeks, to Gentiles, foolishness, but to those who are called, it's the power of God. You want to see true wisdom? It's not in the quoting of philosophers and poets. It's in the cross. You want to see true power? It's not displayed by people flexing their physical muscles. The power of God seen at the cross. Jesus endured the curse for us. You want to see real power under control? He could have called for angels to whip him off the cross and to said, nuke them all. A young Billy Graham once said, the crowd said, they would believe in him if he came down. We believe in him because he stayed up. So this message is for all. How can you say that? I can say it because Jesus said that. Let's go to Matthew chapter 11. We'll close with this. Many times after I've taught on the subject of election, I don't teach on it every week, believe it or not. But when it's in the text, we have to deal with it. And when we do, and our eyes are opened, you see it everywhere in your Bible. You see it in Genesis 1, 2, 3, 4. You see it all the way to Revelation 22. You think, ah, uh, there's not much about it. And then you think, whoa, there is so much about it. In Matthew 11, the word choice and the word election are not found, but it's reeking of it. Verse 25, Matthew 11. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things. That takes activity. If I'm going to hide my glasses so that people don't find it, that takes thought and activity. Where would I hide it that no one would find it? God is hiding the treasure of his truth from some people. You've hidden these things. Let me just say this. If God hides it, you'll never find it. Because he knows everywhere you're going to ever look before he hides it. You've hidden these things. And here's Jesus thanking the Father for this. Not saying, well, this is kind of a blemish on your character, but we'll get over it. He's saying, Father, thank you. Lord of heaven and earth, he's in charge. I don't believe in a God of sovereignty. What does Lord of heaven and earth mean then? That you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. I remember reading that and thought, that's not my view of election. I think it's something to get over, not rejoice in. Gracious? Yeah, it's God. God is amazingly gracious when he reveals something to any of us rebels. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Oh, there is choice. But it's the son's choice. We're not going to know the father unless the son reveals him and the son chooses to reveal him to some whom's, to whom the son chooses to reveal him. Ladies and gentlemen, that's divine election. The word is not there, but the concept is. It's like the word trinity. It's not found in our Bible, but it's there. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in that same breath, without taking a Hebrew coffee break, he then says, come to me all. Well, how can you say come to me all if the father's choosing and the son's choosing and they can't know unless, unless God does something? You see, there's no contradiction. God knows whom he's going to reveal his truth to, but the message is not, 
We're only going to talk to some people whom God has chose. No, we're going to tell everybody. We're going to spread the message. We're going to get the tracks out everywhere. We're going to be promiscuous in the right way with the truth of God's word. We're going to throw it out there and say, come to me all. That's the universal call of the gospel. Jesus believed in sovereign election and the universal call of the gospel. Come to me, everybody, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Ladies and gentlemen, I desire that at King's Church, every preacher that stands behind this pulpit will tell it like it is. That we don't have to say, is it okay to say this, seeing that the Bible says this, knowing that some people will be offended by it? You know who will be offended? The goats. You know who will love it? The sheep. And guess what? We're after sheep. To have a church... Now, you can have a club, you can have a religious thing, but to have a church, you know what you need? Christians. You know how you get them? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So what we say is, if you come to King's Church, you're going to hear the Word of God, you're going to hear it accurately taught to the best of our ability, knowing that we're going to stand and do stand under the gaze of God and we'll answer to Him in judgment. So that if anyone has come to a King's Church service, they've heard the Word of God. They may not like it. Ten years from now, they might still be angry over what they heard. But ten years from now, the Bible will still say what we said it said. Let's pray. Lord, I did desire that everyone under the sound of my voice hear your Word and run to the Son and find in Him eternal life, repenting of sin and believing the true gospel. Let not anyone perish, but come to Christ, believing in him, understanding God's love for the people of this world is seen in the giving of his son. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.